Thank you very much, really helpful. Um, we're on that section of the uh, paper that uh, we've given you. Um, if you want to follow uh, or make notes on this. And the area I'm looking at is uh, particularly about how to identify and then support and provide training for people doing the welcome. Many of you will be in that position now. But before I uh, uh, get into that specifically, there's just sort of a couple of general principles I want to say. Uh, and I want to sort of reiterate already some of the important things that have been mentioned. Um, and uh, like all members of the team now, um, I go to different churches each Sunday. On one occasion, I had a Sunday off, and there was a church I particularly wanted to go to uh, with my wife. Sunday morning, we uh, they got a website, which was a good start. Uh, but then it took us 10 minutes to find when the service was on the website. It was buried away somewhere uh, in a little sort of uh, sidebar. So, uh, you know, I'm not very good, my team will tell you, I'm not very good with computers, so it's probably just me. It took me ages to find just what time the service was on Sunday. But I found it anyway. We went along, um, uh, there was nothing on the website that told us about where to park. And when we got there, there was nowhere to park. So we struggled to find somewhere to park, but we did get there because there was sat in Africa. Then when we got there, the church looked like it was empty, shut. So we went to the notice board at the front of the church. There was nothing on the notice board that says what time the services were. So that didn't help us. We thought, you know, what's going on? Um, and then we went, thought we'd persist. We walked down the sort of uh, main entrance to the church where the big door was obviously the way to go in. It was locked. So we thought, it's obviously closed. It's closed. Um, but then we had a walk around the building and there'd been a lovely extension at the back of the building that created a nice new welcoming new uh, sort of entrance way but there would be no way I would have known that was there there was no signpost from the path to the old main door to where the new main door was so you know already I'd hit about seven or eight barriers which might have put me off before I even got there. When I got there, it was actually closed. It was a fifth Sunday in the month, and the website omitted to say that they did something different on the fifth Sunday in the month. Uh, it only talked about the fourth Sundays of the month. It was just a good example of everything that's been said so far about the importance of the first impressions. The website, the uh, notice board, uh, and then the building. And please can I um, implore you, it's one of my pet hates things, if you're going to put signs up, put quality signs up. You know, if you've got a tatty bit of paper on the, your door in the sort of situation I've just said, that's sort of uh, faded and half ripped and stuck there with a drawing pin, it gives the message, doesn't it? If you're going to, if you're going to put notices up, make sure they're good quality. You know, that this is an important place and we care about this building. So, first impressions are important. The next thing I'd say is that welcoming <coughs> is not just the responsibility of the people who are welcoming on the door, not the person who is uh, shaking hands, it is everybody's responsibility. And it needs to be a genuinely welcoming church. Uh, and I would employ colleagues here, clergy colleagues here, if they don't do this, it ought to be in your preaching uh, itinerary at least once a year. Mark's already sort of scratched the surface on the theology of worship. It is rich, the Bible is rich with it. But we need to be challenging our congregations to be a welcoming congregation. And it might upset a few people, but I'm sorry. You know, if you're in a church where people still think that that seat belongs to them, they need challenging. They need teaching about it in an appropriate uh, way. But we need to teach welcome um, to our people who come to us. So it's everybody's responsibility. And people are looking out for a new person. The third thing is, get, it's really hard to get this right, isn't it? But it's about welcoming, but not smothering. 
Again, in one of my uh, visits to a church, this was a free church, so it doesn't matter. I'm preaching a free church. Uh, but but, but it's, it's a style, it's a style, some people may like it. It irritated me to death. I was overwhelmed. Uh, I was hit by about 12 people from the front door to the seat of people who were clearly on a script uh, and had no real interest in me at all and been told what to say and about six people said exactly the same thing and it was irritating and it was artificial uh, and it was over the top and I felt smothered. I just simply wanted to get to my seat so I could spend two minutes being quiet with God before the service started and I had all these people in my face. So it's about getting the balance right. Welcome, but don't smother. And the other thing to say is beware of the turn-offs for new people. There are plenty of turn-offs, which aren't turn-offs really for most of us. Uh, but in particular, uh, you know, the thing about embarrassing newcomers. Uh, I'm an introvert. Uh, you know, most clergy actually are, they hate being put the front. Uh, I'm one of those. But when someone says to me, if you're here for the first time, put your hand up, or stand up, or let's give them a clap, I'm out that door, I know this business, or at least I'm not going to come back. So, you know, some of the things we think are welcoming, we need to think about. We must not embarrass newcomers. Also, um, you know, boring notices. Another church which will remain nameless went to a church recently. The notices genuinely were longer than the sermon. And it was a free mic time, and anybody who wanted to say anything was, you know, invited to come forward. And of course, everybody's issue is important to them, and so everybody went on and on and on about their issue. And it might have been fascinating for the members of the church. I was bored with this. You know, it needs controlling. Most notices can be given in a handout as people come in, and then somebody from the front just says, can I draw your attention to that one? That's the really important one this week. Thank you. Bam. 30 seconds. Um, or if you do have this sort of facility, it can be rolled like they were this morning on the screen before people come in. I know lots of people don't read it, but at least it reinforces stuff that's given out. Think about notices, and please also think about jargon. You know, we use church jargon. We've been doing it this morning. PST, we're a member of PST. What on earth is PST? Why should anybody even want to worry about it? So we've got to be careful about jargon for newcomers. In the context here today, where you're all church members, is different. But you know, that's another important uh, uh, factor. The other final thing is get it right first time. Uh, please get it right first time. We know that many, many people, uh, it takes them a lot of courage to come to church, believe it or not. You know, when I was uh, vicar at Polly's, where Gina is now, um, one of the things I challenged the church to at the time was to go to a bookmaker's. Because most of them, uh, most of the folks who came to our church weren't the sort of folks who went to bookmaker's. Go to a book it, go in and put a 10p bet on the Grand National, I challenge them to do. And that will make you, help you to feel, experience what it feels like for someone who doesn't normally come to church to come into church. It's an alien environment, you've no idea what's going on. People look at you strangely, like, you know, who are you? You haven't got a clue, you've got to ask people for information because it's not readily there, you know. Um, Get it right first time. Was it something yesterday where the chief executive of the Ritz Hotel Group was speaking about a service? It's quite interesting, he was a Christian. You know, he was saying, we're in the service business, aren't we as a church? We are here to serve people. Jesus was a servant. So there's a great parallel. But one of the things he was saying was, in their business, they reckon, and they do a lot of factual research, they reckon that you've got 10 seconds. 10 seconds, and they talk about the four yard rule to welcome someone, to make a good impression. And so what they teach all their staff to do is if when somebody's within, if someone's got within four yards, 10 feet, whatever four yards is, if that's right, of you, by that time you should have made eye contact with them and you should have smiled with them and you should have said hello. Now, you know, we're not selling products. We're not 
and, and the service industry like they are. But it's interesting, isn't it? First impressions can never be undone. Uh, so we need to get it right first time. So, specific things about um, welcomers and um, identifying uh, and selecting um, people doing welcome. And the first thing to say, I think, is, and it's, a lot of these things are obvious but they need saying, well, people who are doing welcome actually need to be selected. They need to be people who are naturally good with people. You know, they need to be those folks who are warm and enthusiastic and like smiling at people. And it is such an important part in the job. You cannot just leave it. Very often I think we've left it to say, well, this is something anyone can do. So let's get any volunteer, and it might be a good way to encourage someone to do something. And, you know, the 10% is doing all the work in the church anyway, so anybody can do this. I do not think that is true. I think welcomers need to be really careful about who uh, is invited to be on the welcome team. I think the other thing that's important um, is that the people on the front door reflect the age range of the church you are. So if you're fortunate to be a church with all ages, then in your welcome team you ought to have people in there of all ages. And really importantly, if you're running a family service, an all age service, it's a really good idea to try and get a family to be welcoming because you set the tone for what's going to go on in that service right at the very beginning. So if you're fortunate to have enough people to think about variety and different folks on there, think about who it is that on the welcome, you're welcome to. Are they reflecting? the age range of the church? Are they reflecting the age range of the people you are trying to reach? Particularly if you're doing all age and family services. The next thing I think is, uh, and this is not management technique I think, and I know we're getting overwhelmed with that in the church, but I think it is just really good in practice, really good practice for PCC just to write down, you might not call it a job description, you can call it anything, but just a list of what you expect your welcomers to do. Firstly, because it helps you then, you have to actually think through what it is they're actually doing and what you're asking them to do. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, some of the things are obvious but are worth stating, like, you know, if you're unwelcome, what time do you expect people to turn up? Um, you know, as a vicar, uh, I have had people on my welcome teams uh, who uh, regularly turn up five minutes after the service has started. What a waste of time. You know, I'm persistently doing that. Uh, eventually we just had to say, actually I don't think that's your shape. You know, because you can't get out of bed in the morning. Um, you know, so what time do you expect people to bear? What are you asking them to give out? You know, is it clear? Are they giving out the service books? Are they giving out the notice sheets? Just think through what it is that you're asking people to do. Um, what records are you asking them to keep, if any? So, you know, are you asking them to give out and get back welcome cards? Um, one thing I've seen working really well from welcome teams is to have a little book in the team where people make a note um, in the uh, book um, about new folks who've come. You know, at the end of the morning, they just wrote down, met Mr. and Mrs. Smith, or Julie and John, and their three kids. Really nice first visit. And the welcome team will then came next week, or a different people looked at it, and recognised, you know, we're looking out for these people to see if they came back. And then they were able to say, welcome back, really lovely to see you again. Personalising the welcome. It's something that was really simple, and no effort to do. I think it's a good idea to wear a badge. You know, just so people know who you are. And also that you've been, as a, that welcomers have been approved by the church, not just from some random person that's at the door. Um, I think it's a good idea if you've got enough people to be able to uh, have more than just someone at the door, but also someone who's inside the church. Because you don't want to make a bottleneck at the door, um, like we did this morning, and we always do on big dads and events, because everybody arrives at the last five minutes. Um, so if you can have a, a brief welcome at the door, but then have someone just inside who can spend a bit more time 
uh, and help people find a seat, particularly if they're uh, late. I know all your churches are overwhelmed with people and you've no spare seats, but the point is, it's helpful to have someone who could do that. So maybe think about where people are positioned, where you're welcomed, uh, people, where the people are positioned, you're welcomed. And finally, spell out what the responsibility is after the service. That is the worst time for new people. You know this, don't you? The worst time is when all of us go and talk to all our friends um, and uh, warm welcoming. We are a warm welcoming church, means we are a warm welcoming church to each other. Uh, and the person who's new is left on their own and doesn't know what to do. Well, that's a welcomer's responsibility at the end of the service to actually go and make sure that person is offer some refreshments or you know one of the things that is most helpful to do I think uh, is for that person for the welcome team to try and connect those people to, to other folks who um, they might think they are connect with and I know you make assumptions but you know if a family comes it's good to try and say have you met you know John and Julie and their kids just have a word with those and get a natural conversation going or you know if it's an older person have you met Edna I think she lives down your street, I'm not sure. Connect people at the end of the service so that so there's something uh, to make them feel welcome throughout. So job descriptions, I think, are a good idea. <coughs> you just put these up. Some of these things I've talked about, um, but uh, Another thing, if you're selecting people for welcome, and I think this is good for all volunteers in church, is, you know, suggest it's a fixed term commitment that you're asking someone to do that role for. The danger we have, we've all got, isn't it, because we're all there, is you volunteer to do something and you've got a job for life. I think that puts a lot of people off. I met my good friend Mike this morning, uh, who's, I think he's still welcoming at Polycarp, so he was welcoming there when I was there, I suspect he was welcoming for the vicar, probably because he wants to, but some people don't want the job for life. So if you say, I really think you'd be great on the welcome rotor, um, would you think about doing this for 12 months and then we can talk again? I think that's good practice and encourages people. I've talked about locations uh, of welcomers. If you've got one, one, one church, one, one service on the Sunday, it's really good if you can, I know many churches are strapped for for volunteers and things, but to have a dedicated team for each service. So, you know, draw the welcomers out from that service because they're more likely then to spot new people who come to that service. You know, if you've got your welcomers who never go to the early service or to the late service and they don't, they don't get a feel of who's new, that can be difficult. So try and find welcomers um, for each of the service. Uh, and, uh, I think the final thing to say is not just welcome is everyone's responsibility. I think welcome sets the tone for the entire act of worship. And so it is for everyone. So it's not, we're not just talking here about how do we welcome the newcomer. It's how do we welcome Elsie who's been coming every day of her life for 90 years. It's every person who comes through that door deserves an appropriate welcome because it sets the tone for the entire worship experience. If you've been welcomed well, you are in the right frame of mind to continue that act of worship and to meet with God in the right way. If you've been ignored or snubbed or whatever it will be, that will set your mind frame for everything else that's going on for the rest of that morning or that event. So, you know, it really is important. Just a few things to share from my last church in Liverpool where, where I was at. Um, uh, just, uh, some things you may or may find helpful. But in our welcoming team, um, we spent a bit of time together, the people who were on the welcome rotor, we would spend time together trying to just work out what it is we were trying to do. And this is what um, uh, we came up with, the welcome team came up with there. They said that their role was to encourage new people to be drawn into the full body of the church family. That's not just the welcome's job, but the job of the whole church. So again, that thing about not just 
be welcome when they come, but so it is their responsibility to help connect that person to the whole of the church family. How do they do that? And then our aim was to ensure that all newcomers and attendees feel welcome and accepted, are enabled to experience the love of God through worship, fellowship, and hospitality of God's people. And this is a list that uh, of things when we reviewed it uh, um, most recently that people thought they did well. It was a friendly face, a nice smile, a nice handshake at the door at all services. That there was an invitation to stay for drinks after the service. That they told people when they arrived where the toilets were. Not being overpowering. Spotting people who needed space and protecting them. That's the other side of it. You know, a good sensitive welcomer can actually sometimes protect people, depending on what sort of uh, church it is. You know, in our church, uh, which was very friendly and welcoming, you'd often get, you'd often see people who were being touched by God, uh, maybe in tears or just clearly wanting to engage by God and linger at the end of the service. And then, you know, it's sometimes as if you get these oh no moments, moments where you want to do things in slow moment, where you want to go run down the church to stop the person who's going to suddenly interrupt that connection they've got with God. Well, a good welcomer can do that. They spot the newcomer and they can see someone's making a beeline for them. They feel they need a bit of space just to say, just hang on a minute, you know. Um, uh, I think she just needs to be quiet. So, you know, uh, spotting people um, who need space. Um, to, yes, um, offering more information um, to people as they arrive, as appropriate. So we've already said a lot of it can be in, in uh, information sheets, but again sometimes it's obvious if people have come with children, um, it's good for the welcomers to know what's going to go on in the service. Because people, particularly if they come with children, are often have no idea at all, you know, is there a crash? Are the children expected to stay in? If they're, if they're expected to go out, do they have to go out? If I'm here for the first time, can I stay? Can, you know, my, can my children stay with me? Um, so giving people information that's appropriate for, for what's going on in the service. <coughs> I've already talked about having a variety of ages, people involved. Uh, also, you know, giving information to children. We set up a children's forum in our last church. Um, and one of the things the children said back to us, one of the first things some of our children said back to us from our children's forum was, well, why doesn't anybody ever um, welcome us and give us books when we come to church? Why is it always given to be mum and dad? Why do people always talk to mum and dad don't talk to me? I've been coming to this church all my life. I'm only be seven. But I'm treated as if I'm not important. So again, how do you welcome children? What information do you give them? is really important. Mike's going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, things we felt didn't work. Too many people congregating at the door. Really do think about, you know, the positioning of your welcomers and how you get people in first. Too many handshakes, that's, it. that's the overwhelming thing. Um, being ushered in too quickly to the seats. So, you know, what's your writing when you might actually want just to link in and read your notices and things like that. Um, Pushing people to sign up too quickly without that conversation. Just give them information. But people are used to being hassled, you know, can we have the email address? Can we have this? Can we have that? We want to send you a letter. You've got to get the timing of that right. Suggest the first visit is probably not the best time, is my view, to get that sort of info. Um, unless people want to offer it uh, and stuff is available. Uh, not being welcoming to uh, children, giving them too much stuff. Um, finally, from me, before I just show another video, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's good to train the people who are doing welcome. Uh, get them together. I think it's good practice to get them together twice a year. This is a really important part uh, of the life of the church and people need to be affirmed and this role needs to be affirmed and encouraged. If you are doing welcome, are you a wel you're a welcomer here today, you're doing a really, really important job in your church. It's not just a, 
I take this down the road to. So getting people <laughs> together a couple of times a year, maybe with a cake and some coffee and, you know, uh, making it show that they're appreciated is a good thing to do. And then just talk about how things are happening, what can be improved, what could be better. Um, there are also lots and lots of resources that you can use during those times. Lots of worship audits, for instance, and welcome audits. Put one in your pack with a reference on the uh, uh, sheet uh, for where this came from, which will just actually help a welcome team go through and think about all the things we've been saying, uh, talking about this morning, looking at each aspect of the uh, welcome from before people get here to when they leave. If you haven't got a welcome team, that can be done really well as a PCC on one PCC evening. Using something like that is a good thing to do. And there are lots of good videos um, on the website specifically aimed at helping train welcomers. And I'm going to show you one now to finish my slot. Um, uh, and this is called um, If Starbucks Was Like Church. And the premise is, what, how well would Starbucks do if they welcome people like many churches welcome people? And what I want you to do is, as you're watching this, count how many basic mistakes in terms of what we've just been talking about you can see happening on this video. Uh, I'll not tell you how many I uh, came up with. We'll see who found the most mistakes when you see it happening. So if you can that. coffee shop since I was a little girl. At least you've been to a coffee shop. I've never been to one. Do you see their bumper stickers? Check them out. Yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. Why do park so far away? Okay. Check that out. People, people, don't just drink your coffee today. Let it fill you. Let it inspire you. Try an Americana, a mocha latte, even a cappuccino with its rich and satisfying body. Now, I want to remind everyone, don't forget our goal of converting 500 people to coffee. Remember, bring your non-coffee drinking friends with you. Drag them here if you have to. Buy them a scone even. Just get them here. Because remember... Coffee is good. All the time. All the time. We feel we're the coffee best kept good. secret in coffee shops. Last year alone, we had 75 new coffee drinkers, 75 new customers. We're not like those guys down the street that water their product down. We serve nothing but 100% pure coffee. Coffee is so important in everyday life, it's more important than air. Hey, how are you doing? What can I have for you today? Um, I think I just want some coffee. You've never been here before, have you? No. Um, excuse me. If this is your first time visiting with us, would you go ahead and raise your hands? We would love to welcome you. Raise your nice and high. Jabaluya. We would love to get some information about you so we can follow up with you. If you could go ahead and fill those out, we'll be able to get things started. Oh, and when you bring those back to us, we'll have a special gift just for you. We just wanted some coffee. Uh, you can just go ahead and sit right over there to fill those out. That'd be great. Thank you. What could they possibly want all this information? You know, some people go skydiving. I serve people coffee. It's a rush. I love it. I put my heart and soul into that coffee. And there's nothing like seeing somebody take a sip of coffee for the first time in their life. We get a lot of visitors coming through. Not always do they come back, but 
deep down inside, I know a bean's been planted. Some people just can't take the real stuff. Thank you, Barista Mark. It's so good to see everyone at the International Anointed First Starbucks of the Northern Valley. And I want to draw our attention to the tip jar. This is real important. I want to share with you something that happened to me when I was just a new coffee drinker right out of college. I learned that I could combine giving to my barista with my coffee. And this is the result. I found out that when I gave, my coffee came back to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running out all over. And I was a changed man. It's because the word joy, J-O-Y, means Java, others, and you. And when you include the you know, others... I've been thinking about National Coffee Day. National Coffee Day is coming up, you know. And it's always a big day for us, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send out a direct mailer. And I'm sure our attendance is going to more than double, and it's going to change everything. And then in two weeks, we're going to be serving coffee Great. to the Thank homeless. You. And you're not going to want to miss that. Care. What can I get you today? I think I just want some coffee. Okay. That'll be $3.98. Hi. Oh, hey, what did you want to drink? Nothing. Um, I couldn't find the restroom anywhere. Let's, let's just get out of here. And there you are, sir. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot. Your special gift for being a first-time visitor. Thank you. And may your day be filled with coffee. So, so we'll see you next week, right? Yeah. All right. How many mistakes did you spot? Anybody more than 10? Highest number? I got 22 last time I watched it. But you, it makes a lot of the points, doesn't it? That's a good thing, good, to, good little tool you can use with your welcome team to open up conversation. If you go on that particular um, uh, website, um, there are, it's on YouTube, there are a whole load of videos like that along similar themes that you can use to help in training, as well as other resources we've talked about. Coffee time now, so uh, we're